my name is Felicity Parnham. I'm a councillor with Chart Kings Parish Council. And so a little bit of background before we get started. Um, so this initiative is, is kicked off by CK Futures, which is a Chart Kings Parish Council initiative. Um, it came together at the end of 2019, and we were fortunate enough that just before COVID, we were able to meet with the community. And they said to us, they, we'd like you to start thinking about climate and, and engaging on climate and working with us on climate. And just prior to that, um, the borough council had declared climate emergency. And so it kind of gave us the nod to kind of move forward. And so we pulled together a strategy and we've been kind of working ever since on this. And there's a number of initiatives and you'll see a, a table at the back with a whole load of stuff that we're involved with or doing or whatever. And you know, I'm more than happy to, to talk to you after this event a bit more about what CK Futures is doing and anything else to, to, that might be interesting to you. So before we kick off, I'm going to do, do a little bit of housekeeping. So by all means, wear masks, that's no problem at all. Um, we will get to a Q&A session a little bit later on. Um, if you just remove your mask at that point, if you've got a question, just so uh, everybody can hear you, it just, just helps with, with this. You'll also see that uh, Max has been well and truly recorded. And uh, so <laughs> we've got two cameras on here. So also after the event, you'll be able to see it. We'll, we'll put it up on the, the web pages. Uh, so if anybody has got a problem with that, you know, obviously um, we will, it's not aimed at you, it's, it's aimed here. So that should be okay. <laughs> um, so uh, any, uh, anything else? Um, oh, just a, if, I mean, obviously no plan for a fire alarm, but if there was a problem, there's obviously the door there and uh, there's in the fire exit over here. Okay, so um, to introduce Max, so I suspect a few people already know Max because he is the um, councillor, uh, Max Wilkinson, cabinet member, um, Cheltenham, Borough Count uh, Cheltenham Borough Council, and his focus has been on the climate emergency. And he's been working hard with his team uh, to create the climate emergency action plan, uh, the pathway to net zero. So this evening is all about hearing about that, what, how that's shaped up, what's happening next, and also, as I say, your opportunity to ask some questions. So, over to you, Max. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felicity. And thanks, everyone, for coming along. Um, before we start, does anyone in the room believe that climate change isn't a problem? Good. That's a good start, because that means that what I say next is probably going to be quite relevant. Um, so, before we go into the main meat of the presentation, I just thought it was useful to start with a bit of a sort of utopian dream uh, about a world in which all of our homes are powered entirely by renewable energy, no one lives in fuel poverty, uh, and we're not in hock to fossil fuel companies, which would be a really important step to take, uh, and a world in which we view ourselves as part of nature rather than competing with nature, uh, a world in which we, hold, we make ourselves healthier by walking, cycling, using electric vehicles, uh, rather than uh, using petrol or diesel cars, um, and a world in which we are routinely at risk of flooding. These are all things that should be important to us, and it shouldn't seem utopian to try to achieve that, but unfortunately at the moment, it does seem a little bit utopian because we're so far away from it. But what Cheltenham is trying to do with this Climate Emergency Action Plan um, is move somewhere towards that, and clearly as, as a borough of about 115,000 or so people, there's only a limited contribution that we can make, but I think it's important um, that we re reflect um, our town's values, our borough's values, the values of Charlton Kings as a village, in trying to do our bit and contribute from the grassroots up. So I'm here to present the Climate Emergency Action Plan, Pathway to Net Zero, uh, which is Cheltenham's 2030 action framework to become a net zero county <coughs> borough. And for the first time ever, as part of this process, I've been turned into a Memoji there. Um, in the bottom left hand corner, so I thought I would pop that on there. Uh, I was flattered when the designers decided that was necessary. Um, ne next slide please, thank you. So, a little bit of background. Um, this action plan that we're talking about tonight, it follows our declaration uh, of a climate emergency. That was back in 2019. Not long after that, of course, we entered into a pandemic, so um, clearly work has slowed a little bit on that front. However, that doesn't mean that nothing has happened in uh, the interim. So in the interim period, we have published the Carbon Neutral Cheltenham Report, which was a scoping document. It wasn't a detailed action plan. It set out some of the indicative actions uh, that Cheltenham as a borough could take if we wanted to get to 
to net zero. Uh, and we'll do a bit of jargon busting later on about the difference between net zero and carbon neutrality. That might be one for audience participation because I'm sure you know just as much about that as I do. Um, this, uh, this action plan uh, is, uh, it covers eight key topic areas um, and actions within them that we could take um, to get to net zero. Um, it's set over three different time periods, so over the next couple of years, over the next three or so years after that, and then over the next three years after that. Um, and the action plan also is backed by a green deal, which is an investment fund which we can use to back some of the projects uh, that we will need to undertake to get there. Um, I did say that although we're some way on from our climate emergency declaration, uh, it didn't mean that nothing else had happened in the meantime. And I'll just give a flavour of some of the things that have happened since we declared our climate emergency. So um, we have our first carbon neutral council houses that are going through the planning system. They've been given planning permission uh, at Swindon Road, and that's going to be a really important development for Cheltenham. And interestingly, since we started talking about carbon neutral council houses, our first private sector develop development of carbon neutral houses has come forward too in Leghampton, which is a really important step forward. And uh, we should all give props to Newland Homes, who I think are the developer in that, uh, in that case, um, and clearly that's going to make a big uh, difference. Um, and, and it is really important that when we are building our own council houses, and Cheltenham investing £180 million in council houses, we are setting high environmental standards. So when developers come to us and they say, we want to build 50 houses, 100 houses, 200 houses, or even more than that, um, we say, well, why don't you match what the council is investing in its own council houses with your private sector developments so we can, as a, as a town and as a borough, make sure that we are minimising fuel poverty and, let's be honest, stopping us in two or three years' time or four years' time or five years' time having to retrofit at great expense houses that will be owned by people in Cheltenham. Can I just ask you something, as you mentioned housing, what, but you don't seem to have any powers to enforce developers to say, for example, put solar panels on the roof and that sort of thing as part of the conditions for planning. So how can you really get any leverage if developers who seem very reluctant to do this, even though we, you know climate change and all this has been around now for some years, um, and if you don't see much uh, many new houses with anything like that on round here anyway? You're absolutely right, and I would hope we would get onto that in questions in a bit more detail. But you've neatly preempted my next point about what we've done in the meantime. Uh, and that is, uh, we started producing our um, climate and nature supplementary planning document. And planning is not always the most exciting topic to talk about, but it is really important. And our supplementary planning document will back our local plan and our joint core strategy with a framework of actions um, that need to be taken, we think, by developers, um, either small scale developers or large scale developers, or even if you're just renovating your house. Um, to make sure that we're addressing the climate emergency. And, uh, an important part of that, unfortunately, is that government planning regulations are not moving fast enough. So Cheltenham supplementary planning document will, will have some weight in planning, but it will not have 100% weight. So for, that, will, that will give a good nudge and a good steer to developers. But what it won't do is say you absolutely 100% have to do it because, uh, unfortunately, the government is rather dragging its feet on planning reform. But that, that's a good point, and you, you're absolutely right. Um, as it happens, the houses of 320 Swindon Road will have solar panels on them and, and other forms of renewable energy generation, um, which is going to be really uh, important for us. Um, a, another thing that we've done is uh, £50,000 uh, Cheltenham Zero Fund, which has funded um, about a dozen or so community projects in Cheltenham, um, and various other points as well, which uh, we can perhaps discuss uh, in more detail later on. Next slide, please. So, jargon-busting slide. Carbon neutral versus net zero. Would anyone in the audience like to have a go at defining what the difference is? Well, then it's up to me. Um, and uh, in broad terms, and there, there will be people in the room who know a little bit more about it than, than I do. In broad terms, um, carbon neutral is more about offsetting, and net zero is about getting to the minimum number, uh, or the minimum level of emissions first before you then um, start to offset. Uh, and if anyone takes issue with that definition, we can perhaps have a chat uh, in the questions, but there will be people who know more about it than me in the room this evening. Um, uh, in our action plan, we've gone for net zero. 
um, you'll have noted, oh sorry, sorry. back with, um, <laughs> we're, we're aiming for, for net zero uh, and, uh, and it's important that we do that because we think um, that is the right way to, uh, to address um, the climate uh, emergency and that's the right way to address it and we can't just simply carry on saying it'll be business as usual but we'll plant a few trees and then we'll hope for the rest. Um, on the other side of the slide there you'll see the municipal offices, that's the base um, of uh, the town, uh, sorry, of the, the borough council, um, and then a map of the whole of the borough. Uh, and our, our target for net zero is not just about Cheltenham Borough Council uh, and Cheltenham Borough Council's emissions, which we are trying to get down to zero, obviously. Um, it's, it, it covers the entire borough. And you can see the difference of the scale um, between the council and the rest of the borough there. Um, so, as I understand it, our borough carbon footprint is roughly equivalent to Belize, um, the country, and uh, our, our, our council carbon footprint is, what's that about, one one hundredth of the size uh, of it. So um, the council can and should be able to get to net zero by 2030 because we are the masters of our own destiny, albeit we own some very old drafty buildings like the municipal offices. Um, like the Pitville Pump Room, uh, like the Town Hall, which, um, which come with challenges if you're going to try to get to net zero as an organisation, we should be able to get there. Um, but the wider borough is clearly going to be hugely challenging, um, and there are many things without the Council's control um, that we will have to, to take on uh, to get there. And we, we can go on to talk about that a little bit more later on. Next slide, please. So I mentioned there were eight areas and they are represented by the, uh, the different sentences here. So, um, leading by example, active travel, transport and air quality, natural environment and biodiversity, water and waste, collective action, buildings and energy, finance, funding, investment and procurement, and then decision-making policies, plans and strategies. And these are, all, uh, these are all of the eight topics that we think we need to get through if we're going to get to net zero. What we don't have underneath all of those eight topics is an incredibly prescriptive list of things um, that, we are, that we are intending to do. Um, we've got broad actions, and we can talk about those in a bit more later on. Um, but I'll give you a flavour of some of them. So, for example, the Borough Council is undertaking its most thorough ever carbon footprinting uh, exercise, and we've, uh, we've managed to... Um, bring in more of the emissions that previously we weren't measuring um, to set a new baseline for our own activities. And that might sound small in itself, but then when we start to talk about the organisations that we deal with and asking them to report their own carbon emissions so we can then work out what our scope three emissions are, and scope three emissions are, the experts tell me, much more difficult to record, um, we then start to hopefully create a positive cycle where Organisations within Cheltenham are all starting to measure their carbon footprinting, uh, their carbon footprint, and, and do annual carbon footprinting. Uh, we're encouraging that, um, by the way, through Vision 21 um, and our carbon, uh, our Cheltenham Zero partnership, um, which is undertaking quite a lot of um, carbon footprinting exercises uh, across the borough. I mentioned our supplementary planning documents earlier on. Um, one of the uh, one of the points about about that, as as I mentioned, is that um, it, it is. It is not entirely within our gifts to enforce all of the things within it, but we think it is an important part of the, uh, of the steps that we need to take and that we should be taking and that developers within Cheltenham should be taking to make sure that we all get to net zero. It also covers biodiversity as well, which is an increasingly, it's increasingly recognised that the two, uh, the two things go hand in hand. We can't simply say um, that we have a climate emergency without recognising the biodiversity crisis um, as well. Um, one, to one of the topics on here is uh, buildings and energy, and um, we haven't yet press released this, so knowledge of it um, is, not very, is not very wide within Cheltenham, so you're among a, an elite group of people who know about this. And we are in the early stages um, of working on a heat network scheme with, um, uh, with the government, uh, with BAES, the, the government department. And at the moment, it's at the very earliest stages. You can look on the gov.uk website and see um, the process that the government is setting out and when they think that legislation will be in place. But we got in on the ground floor, so we should be in a position where if it is possible to deliver um, a heat network within Cheltenham, um, then we should be able to uh, 
that we should be able to be one of the organisations that is being supported in that. Now, again, I'm not a scientist and an expert in this, but the experts tell me that heat networks essentially you have one big source of heat and it could be a crematorium or it could be a leisure centre or it could just be another building uh, and then all the excess heat from that building is piped underground and then is used to heat, uh, heat other buildings in the vicinity. Now there may be people in the room who are shaking their heads and telling me I've got the def definition slightly wrong there um, but again one for the questions later on. I'm, I bet Peter knows the, uh, the definition of a heat network better than I do. Um, there we go. Fingers are being pointed already. Um, we'll chat about that more later on. But, but this is an important point because decarbonising the energy sources of our building is going to be a really important part of, of our journey um, to net zero. Um, and it is worth just touching on the point about transport uh, and active travel. Um, the Borough Council is not the Highways Authority. We don't have really any powers over transport, but what we can do is set a vision for what we think sustainable transport should be like in Cheltenham. Um, we've submitted that to the County Council, it's called the Connecting Cheltenham Report and we're hopeful that the County Council will in time um, adopt the schemes that we've set in there including things like a, a new bus hub uh, and also a, a network of cycle paths uh, and then moving towards pedestrian um, priority over cars uh, and those sorts of issues. Um, all alongside it and those the, the connecting channel report is a very good piece of work it's very detailed you can see it on the borough council website um, I, I think that is at the that is at the heart of decarbonization decarbonizing our transport network within Cheltenham uh, and I would urge you to all have a look um, next slide please thanks <coughs> and I mentioned that it's all underpinned <coughs> by the Green Deal because clearly a lot of the things that were on the last slide and a lot of the things in the action plan, um, they're going to cost a, an awful lot of money. Um, what, we don't, what we're not able to do is borrow a huge amount of money and then invest it in things that won't make a financial return. Unfortunately, um, the council officers tell me as a borough council we simply can't do that. But what we can do uh, is borrow money and raise money, and that could be from the Public Works Loan Board, it could be from community green bonds, which might give everyone in the room this evening an opportunity to get involved. We can borrow and then invest in projects that make a revenue return and then use that again to create a positive cycle where funding is being put back into the system. So these are the principles of Cheltenham's Green Deal. And we're looking at projects that could be up to 20 years um, in length to pay back. They, we're looking at projects that would pay back at least 3% revenue. Uh, we're investing up to £10 million in the first instance. Um, it's within the borough of Cheltenham, and this is an important point. Quite a lot of councils around the, the country have pursued strategies of commercialisation where they've bought, I don't know, let's say shopping centres hundreds of miles away from their borough boundaries or their council boundaries. Um, in Cheltenham, we don't think that's the right approach. We think we should be supporting local schemes and local projects. So everything we will be doing will be within either the borough boundaries of Cheltenham or around five miles from those borough boundaries. Uh, and we're looking for low to medium risk projects. We're also acutely aware of the fact that a few councils have got into difficulties by uh, investing uh, in energy schemes and perhaps buying energy companies in some cases, uh, and then they've ended up in the hole for quite a lot of money. And while we must deal with the climate emergency, what we don't want to do is put ourselves in a position where we're going bust and then we can't do the things that we need to do under statutory, uh, under statutory powers um, that borough councils have. Uh, and also, if we get into a position where we have no money, we won't be able to do any of the stuff that's in the action plan either. So we need to make sure we're doing this um, in, in the right way, uh, cautiously, but also ambitiously. Uh, and the scheme that we've set up, the Children's Green Deal, um, this will ensure that we have um, that we're able to make decisions on uh, on quite a dynamic basis. So, for example, if Child and Kings Parish Council came us, came to us and said we've got some land and you can invest in this scheme on it, um, we should be able to make a decision in quite quick uh, in in quite quick uh, order. So we, that should mean that it could be ten thousand pounds, it could be a hundred thousand uh, pounds, depending on the level of investment. We would need to either take it to the council or the cabinet or have a directed decision but we should be able to be responsive as the opportunities in the borough arise which is an important principle because we're dealing with an emergency so there's no point in uh, making it in making a, a system which means we've got six months or a year to make a decision on an important investment project um, just clarify is it 10 million over 20 years or 10 years 
uh, is 10 million in total. 20 years is the length of the investment, so the, the investment will be a maximum of 20 years. Oh, 10 million for the other 20 years. It, it, multiple projects, though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you and questions, and there's the emoji again. Um, I thought I would keep it as a, as a quick run through, uh, and then we could get into the meat of the discussion afterwards. So um, hopefully that's given a decent overview, uh, and then we can um, we can have discussions uh, over and above those we've already had. I'm going to go behind you, sir, because uh, you had two goes already. Um, lady in the hat. Thank you. Um, this is a two-part question. Actually, I've got another question after that as well. But the first part is about consumption. What is, and this is for Rose Leonard, who's not here because she's just getting into COVID. So, um, what is the council going to do about bringing down people's personal consumption? We live on a finite planet and we can't keep consuming it if we have infinite resources. And as personal consumptions of clothes, cars, carpets, concrete is about 25% of our carbon footprint, if the plan doesn't address this, then that is a huge part of the borough emissions which is not accounted for. We can't keep offshoring the emissions embodied in things that we buy, which are made elsewhere. That's not social justice. I mean, this is this is a very good point, and it goes to the heart of the struggle that we have as a borough council because um, our powers are are very limited. What we can do, and there is a there is a section of this um, of this action plan uh, which is uh, about uh, leading by example and um, decision making policies, plans, and strategies. Um, and and oh no, sorry, it's the bottom, one in the bottom right hand corner. I can see it. It's collective action, influencing, engaging, campaigning, and behaviour change. That is the one that this falls under because. Essentially, we have a, a large-scale behaviour change project for 150,000 people or so. Um, what we can do is support initiatives like Planet Cheltenham, which has been set up. We can support CK Futures. Um, we can support um, local-level action, uh, and and we can we can do that via money or or by promotion or by working with and helping share resources. Um, but it does go to the heart of the problem. Uh, the borough council doesn't have the powers to go into your home or anyone's home here and say, consume less, do less. What we can do is try to create a culture in which people feel like they need to consume less and that they, need, and that they don't need to consume quite as much um, on, on X, Y or Z, whether it's, you know, whether it's new clothes and buying uh, second-hand clothes instead or whether it's buying different types of food or, or whatever. Um, but it, it's, Rose makes a good point as usual, and I hope she gets well soon. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, this is that's about sort of wide scale, national, international behavioural change and changing the system that we exist within. Cheltenham Borough Council will be trying to stimulate that through grassroots activity, and we're in touch with Rachel at Planet Cheltenham um, very regularly, and supportive of that initiative. Indeed, I visited earlier on with Peter. Yeah, it's. Um it's a balance because you know a lot was mentioned about money, how much money is spent here, how much the dog pet festival brings in, and the festivals and all that sort of thing. But actually, we want to try and reduce consumption because it's the resources that we're 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 stealing and you know um, using so much of it that, that we can't keep up with it and we'll we'll run out. But on the subject of food that you mentioned, that's another issue about where our food comes from. Um, and I'm just part of Chapman is growing, which is we're looking at community projects of so people growing their own food. And we mentioned Newland Homes. Now they have bought some land off the Diocese of Gloucester, up near um, where they well, on the land that used to be nurseries, children's nurseries. We had a, three big nurseries in that area off Kidnappers Lane. And the infrastructure for growing our food is there. So they're buying it and tear them down and build houses on it. That won't feed us. So um, my issue with Newman's home is great, they've got great designs, but we are building on green fields. Whatever happened to the green belt? There are many elements to the question you've asked there, um, but it's a fair point. Um, consuming food closer to home, that's produced closer to home, is clearly going to be uh, an important part of the solution. Um, my, my personal view is that I'm not sure we can say no more development on any field ever. Um, and there is a difference between green field and green belt, of course, and not all green belt land 
um, is, as, is as fertile as some of the areas that you've just, you've just mentioned. Um, so, I mean, the, the, all the points you've made are very valid. There, there isn't really a direct answer to it. Um, indeed, there, were, there wasn't quite a direct question there, but I, I can speak in general terms about what you're saying, and producing more food and consuming it closer to home is clearly a good thing. You're talking about carbon that is produced by things that we consume, like food that's produced elsewhere and brought into Cheltenham more. Not just food, so recognising the full part of the carbon footprint of Cheltenham, which is about 860,000 tonnes, as opposed to the 560,000 tonnes that we have planned. So it's an extra 300, and because it's so big, I think there needs to be some recognition of that. Understood. Uh, the, the figures that I used were from the Carbon Neutral Cheltenham Report, which was the scoping report back from 2019, but I'll take that back to the council officers and we'll have a discussion about it. I suspect it won't change the content of the um, Climate Emergency Action Plan, um, but the Action Plan is updatable, so it's not a, it's not a document that will stay the same over time. Um, it will be reviewed probably on an annual basis to take into account um, new knowledge, um, things that change in terms of technology, um, and, and anything else that uh, becomes available for us to, to do. Uh, lady there. Um, what are we going to do about insulating our homes? And um, that is probably a major leak that we have here. And, and also, I think on the, the campaigning, I think um, we should campaign in our schools and we should teach our young people to be citizens, not consumers, and teach our whole the whole of Cheltenham, we should all consider ourselves to be citizens rather than consumers, and I think um, that would be a good way forward, but I'm really interested in how we're going to insulate our homes and what's going to be done there. Uh, yeah, with great difficulty, I think, is the answer to the question. Um, the, the, the council house um, problem uh, in terms of energy and efficient homes is, is one that we uh, have a fairly clear path to dealing with. Um, we are, uh, we are in receipt of a, a grant from the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund. Um, and it's interesting to note actually that since all the councils, and this goes back to the point about campaigning and why it's important for local areas to declare climate emergencies, since, since areas started declaring climate emergencies, um, the government has put an awful lot more money out there and available for local areas to bid for, which is a, which is a good start. But, and there is always a but, isn't there? Um, it's not enough, and the, the figures that I can tell you about the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund um, put it into stark reality. So we've got about 4,500 council houses in Cheltenham, and we've just bid successfully for £800,000, which, which uh, is um, a decent chunk of money and a decent sized bid compared to other areas. We've bid jointly with Stroud in a consortium, um, and that will help us retrofit uh, about 59 uh, of our uh, worst performing council houses. Um, so if it's 59 wow. and we've got another 4,500 or so to go, it's going to take an awfully long time to get there. As technology um, matures, it is going to become much easier to invest. But it's worth bearing in mind again that the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund is about bringing the least um, high performing or the lowest performing council houses uh, up to a sort of decent standard on EPC ratings. That isn't making them uh, all uh, net zero homes or, uh, or carbon neutral. Um, it, it is simply making them not the most drafty in town. Uh, now, there's obviously going to be a lot more work that needs to be done um, to get the rest of our council houses to, to net and zero. What about private houses? And I'm yes, and, and this is the point. Um, you then move into private houses. Now, not everyone has the money sloshing around to pay for their house to be retrofitted to whatever level, whether it's EPCA or, or, or better. Um, so there, there will have to be an opportunity there, I think, in future for, um, for governments, I think, to, to, 
take a, a more expansive role um, in, I guess, the kind of schemes that have failed so badly in the past um, and actually make them work in future. Uh, unfortunately, when the government's tried to introduce those in the past, it just hasn't worked out and the, the take up on these kind of things has been um, extremely low. Um, what we can do is um, start to uh, tweak our tweak our, uh, the rules that we're setting in terms of um, planning and development rules. Um, there's a role for, for government to set higher building standards, uh, sorry, building regulation standards as well. Um, but it's, it's a huge problem, and particularly in places like Cheltenham, where we've got an awful lot of old houses. I think it's just worth mentioning at that point, we're just about to launch in Charlton Kings um, uh, an initiative to offer advice uh, on um, green energy consumption um, in an informal way mm -hmm. to anybody who wants it. And indeed, we have a, a, the use of a thermal camera as well to um, perhaps offer a footprint of your own home and see how neat it actually is. Mm -hmm doesn't solve the problem of, of how you might pay for the necessary measures, but I think a lot of people probably don't even understand what measures they could take and, and how cheap they might be to implement if they really set about it properly. So I, I hope that people will want to take advice, uh, to be, take advantage of that uh, advisory service and we can encourage more people to think about this problem in their own home and what they actually do. Yes, one, one of the things that the Cheltenham Zero Partnership is going to be doing is produce case studies um, from different types of developments. Uh, so some of them might be building a new house that is um, net zero. It might be retrofitting a home to make it carbon neutral in operation. Um, and over time, um, we hope that the, the Cheltenham Zero Partnership, which we're um, engaged in with Vision 21, um, that will become a place where if you want information about that kind of thing in Cheltenham, you'll be able to go there and you won't just be able to view the case study on the website, you'll be there, able then to talk to somebody who can give you advice as well. Um, but the, the initiative in Charlton Kings is obviously welcome too. There was, oh, uh, I, I think I'm going to come back to this gentleman because he had his hand up um, right at right. the side. Uh, one or two questions I wanted to ask. First of all, I was a original member of Sustainable Gloucestershire. The Vision 21 report published in 1996, regarded as the best in the country. I worked on a transport and economy working groups, amongst other things. Um, have you ever read this? Uh, Just a long time ago. I was only 12 then. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave will have one at at least one at Vision 21 as he now exists. Dave wasn't involved in the original project. Um, but if you would, if this had all been followed, and it was a national wide strategy, it wasn't just Gloucestershire, and it was done county wise, we wouldn't be sitting here today talking in these contexts we're now talking about because this was about a sustainable future and the actions one should take. The, and we were very effective at engaging with people then. Of course, we had a professional organiser, Lindsay Colborn. Forrest was hovering in the background with Matthew and so on. And the biggest problem I see now is that, that people, the band in the street doesn't seem to be engaged, either by the council, and I know you met, I've seen publicity about your relationship with Vision 21, etc., and calling meetings of business people and so on, but not, nothing for local people. The second problem I've observed, because I left Cheltenham in 2000, I came back in 2017, and even making allowances for the COVID situation, when I see the number of cars on the road in Cheltenham, I realise that people don't associate their actions with the consequences of using their car. Obviously, COVID has exacerbated that, so it's all got muddled up in the mix. But the problem is that people don't don't take account of what they do as being relevant to helping in small ways to improve the environment and reduce their consumption emissions. And I don't see, I'm wondering how you're going to engage all, a significant number of people in Cheltenham to actually think about what they do, their actions, you know. I don't drive my car if I can walk. I use the bus, but lots of people won't use the bus at the moment because of COVID and all that, you know. I mean, it's only pensioners like me who've got a few passive things to use the buses coming up here. And that's the big issue because I, and there's, I bet the people who've got other things in their lives, of course, apart from the environment. But if you can build, build up positive habits, it ain't going to change the world, which will help in small ways. You know, like this lady's talking about massive overconsumption. Do I really need that sort of stuff? On the other hand, we depend on consumption for taxation and all the rest of it, aren't we? Creating jobs, so it's about done in the hair. But the whole economic system is really need change, and you ain't going to do that in, uh, 
you know, that's nothing, nothing to do with the local authorities specifically, is it? You know? And so, I just, the, the key question really is, I think you ought to read this because a lot of what is, it's a long report, but there was a, a pricey idea for Gloucester County Council, which I don't know the days got one of those, but this was um, Lynn, Sir Chris Vincent Cowley's thought on this. He died about a, two, two or three weeks ago, chief society fox to the government, um, and so on. So the, the key issue is how are you going to persuade people to change their habits in sufficient number to make a useful and significant difference to the, we talk about just zero carbon, it's really about sustainable development because everything is unsustainable, isn't it? You see? I mean, it's not just, it's all got subsumed into this carbon issue, but the whole issue, the whole lifestyle, the whole, everything we do is unsustainable, as this lady's pointing out at the back, because that's what she's talking about, not sustainable. But you can make people, try and persuade people to change their habits. But I find it very difficult to see that anybody's paying any attention in Cheltenham uh, from what I observe is transport issues. You've made a number of interesting points. I'll, I'll, I'll happily take a copy of the report uh, and uh, undertake to read it. Um, the, the, the point that you make about people not associating their actions um, with negative uh, outcomes, I think is, is instructive for all of us. Um, we can, and also you mentioned about how we can actually engage people uh, in, in, what to, in what to do uh, and how to do the right things. Uh, some, of the, some of the answer is engaging with kids in schools, which was mentioned earlier on. Um, some of the answer is initiatives like Planet Cheltenham. Some of the answer is people finding out more information by going on the Cheltenham Zero website or going on the CK Futures website and finding out what they can do in their homes or how they can adjust their everyday lifestyles. I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all because not everyone is going to um, engage with any issue in exactly the same way. Um, but, but you're right, everything you've said is absolutely right. And I can see why you're frustrated because if I'd been doing the same thing for the last 25 years, I would, uh, I'd be very frustrated too. Um, but, but absolutely, let, let's, uh, let's chat afterwards and I'll read the report. Okay. Um, I think the gentleman in the front yeah. row here was next, and then it's Paul at the back. Apologies for coming in late. You may have covered this. By the way, I contributed to that document as well. I still have it on, and it's worth reading. Um, flexibility in terms of the conservation area. Um, mm -hmm. I live in right by Montpellier Gardens. Mm -hmm. Not a listed building. Uh, I'm just doing a lot of reckless building. Um, but I want to put PV panels on the roof. Are the council in getting more flexible on those issues? That's a very good question. Uh, and the answer is the Climate SPD will move us in the right direction. And the Climate <coughs> SPD specifically picks up the point uh, about uh, heritage and conservation and how that is offset against um, the, the climate emergency and reduce the need to reduce um, greenhouse gas consumption. So yeah, you're right. Um, that we are addressing that. Uh, it's extremely frustrating. Uh, a case in point, um, not a million miles away from where I live in the centre of town, there was a gentleman who was trying to um, retrofit his house uh, and one of the things he wanted to put on was a heat pump. Um, and he wanted to get rid of his gas boiler. Unfortunately, the application was uh, going to be refused by the planning officers because it was against heritage and conservation rules and it was a bit too noisy and it was, it was close to something else. Actually, when you looked at it, it was uh, on a wall above a car park um, at the end of Sydney Street, if anyone knows that bit of, of Cheltenham. There's no reason you would have cut through there specifically, but, um, but you can go and have a look. And you can, see, you can see the heat pump. I have to say, it's not particularly beautiful when you go and have a look at it. But I would rather that was on the outside of the building for me to look at it and think that's not very nice than to have a gas boiler on the inside, which is doing far worse to the planet than the aesthetic damage um, that I might think is not very nice. And actually, once you see it once and you see that it's different, you, you quickly uh, you quickly realise that it's not that big a deal. Not, and they're not noisy. Well, this one apparently isn't particularly noisy. Um, there are, there, there are some models, I'm told, that are a little bit noisier. Um, but it, interestingly, this one only e ended up going up um, because when I found it was going to be refused by the, planning, uh, by the planning officers, I called it into the planning committee and then went along to the planning committee and said, we should have the heat pump. Uh, and then the man was able to put his heat pump up. But it shouldn't be the case that every time someone wants to put a heat pump up instead of a gas boiler, um, they have to sort of 
cause a fuss and make a rumpus and ask me specifically or their local councillor specifically to call it into the planning committee and then um, and then we'll go and spend our evening talking about a heat pump that should have been approved in the first place and that, that applies to numerous other bits of technology as well. Um, we'll get there, that's the answer. And, and there should be a system, um, to go for planning permission is an additional cost, there should be a shorter route. Well, I, I'm not a planning expert, but I suspect that in this case, he probably only had to apply for planning permission because it was in a heritage and conservation area. So we need to find a way of sort of shortcutting that. Um, the, the SPD does pick it up. I suspect that the real solution will probably be in the next local plan, which will have um, full statutory weight. Uh, Paul. Yeah, I just wanted firstly to come back on the gentleman in front. Um, quite right. It's I use the public transport a lot more now than I used to do. I drive a lot less, but there are places and times when I can't use a bus because there isn't one. Uh, I can't get from my partner in Dumbleton into town on a Saturday night anytime after about seven o'clock. We certainly can't get back to the taxi ride. So, and, and, and I know kids that are um, being driven to school every day because of split families, because partly because of COVID, but they're having to cap. They can't buy a season ticket effectively because they have to buy two, and they can't afford that. So there has to be an alternative infrastructure in place that effectively says to me, do you know what, it's cheaper for you to catch the bus and they've got the parking and it's a lot quicker and more convenient than getting in your car. And until that happens, you won't persuade people out of their cars. And the problem, I mean, if I go back many, many years, I lived up in South Yorkshire and the South Yorkshire Passenger Transport Executive. And you could go virtually anywhere within Doncaster and the areas around it but I think it, back then it was 2p. It was ridiculously cheap because it was subsidised by the council. Now, the problem there is you need the money coming into the council to be able to subsidise that if you're going to do subsidised buses to get people into it. So clearly there's a funding problem, but it's something to think about in the future because I think there's a net gain by having subsidised um, bus transport or tram or whatever. Um, from my own question really is, is there any, um, like a central hub, like an ideas hub where people can put ideas in to help the council um, to say, well, have you thought about this or is this a good idea? And also a way of coordinating volunteer effort. This goes to the heart of many of the discussions I have with people in Cheltenham about the environment and probably everything when we get to it, sort of boils down to how can I uh, and how can the council help the individual in question solve climate change without delay? Uh, and uh, and the short answer is, I can't, and the council can't either. Um, we can put in place frameworks and structures. We can change rules. We can campaign. We can ask the government to do more. Um, we can work with parishes. We can work with community groups. <laughs> but ultimately, there there is a, there is an issue here that there the council has probably. I don't know how many people engaged in environmental stuff. We've got four people on our climate emergency team. We've got a planning department, which has probably got another couple of dozen people in it, maybe, um, if you take all of the associated services around it. Um, and then, really, if there's 150 people a day saying to me, can, can I help them solve climate change? The answer is probably no, unfortunately. Um, but we can set up structures that people can engage with. So, for example, we're giving financial support to Planet Cheltenham, which will be a way in which people will be able to engage um, in a number of different activities, um, whether it's things like community fridges or libraries of things or, or, or whatever, repair workshops, that kind of thing. And some of those things already exist through Vision 21, um, but Planet Cheltenham will be able to take that on. Um, the Cheltenham Zero Partnership will enable people to get advice about retrofitting their home or um, whatever else they might want to do. Um, there is, I believe, a portal on Cheltenham Zero's website where you can submit ideas. Um, whether they come through to the Borough Council or not in the end um, is, a, is a discussion because there won't all be things that the Borough Council can do. But certainly, we will always consider ideas if people say, here is a way that you could adjust your policy X, Y or Z uh, to make a difference. Um, but the, but you've, you've gone to the heart of the discussions that we have quite often here, Paul, and the, yeah. the, the, issues, the issue is the Borough Council is not in all cases your best route to changing your life and your world to solve climate change. Um, but, but we can set up things that do help you do that. And, uh, but it's not necessarily always going to be Cheltenham Borough Council says you do this. It could be community organisation like CK Futures says you can engage with 
your local community by doing this, that or the other. It could be volunteering for another group. Um, there isn't really a one-size-fits-all thing in the same way that we were talking about. Not everyone will have the same way of engaging with the uh, climate emergency um, as everyone else. I'm just wondering if you can get more input into the planning system. I'll give you one example. One of the big problems that's putting a lot of carbon in the air is when you get roofworks because mm -hmm. utilities have to come up. And that's not very well coordinated across the country. You've got water, gas, electric. Don't all go down the same manholes and all that kind of stuff. What is worse, though, is we put them underneath the roofs rather than underneath the pavements. Now, it's easier to pull a pavement up and people can walk around it than it is to dig up a road that then gets heavy lorries driving over it and all sorts of all problems afterwards. And as soon as you dig up a road, okay, you've still got to go across roads. But if you were to put those, just shift them on new estates, you can't retrofit until something breaks and then you have to fix it. But on new planning, if you shift it to the pavements, you keep the roads open. Because the problem is people will use the road, they have to do. And when you put roadblocks in, which is what's happening now, I mean, the government's had two years to sort out all these roadblocks where it was quiet due to COVID, and you couldn't go anywhere. What they're doing now, they're just pissing everybody off, to put it mildly, with huge delays everywhere. And the carbon is just chucking out, um, and it's going up in the atmosphere because of all the delays. So those are simple things that can be done if somehow people like me can get that message through to the people who sign off on the new planning paperwork and say, well, no, Mr. Developer, you're not going to do it that way. You're going to do it this way because we're going to insist on it. If, presumably, you've got the power to do that. And then at least the next estate that gets built will have the solar panels, will have the heat pumps, will have the pipe works and the utilities running underneath the pavements, not on the roofs. And then 20 years down the line, it needs repairing done it right in the first place, you don't have all these problems building up again. Well, I can't tell you for sure that cables and pipes under roads um, uh, is in the climate SPD, but I'll certainly ask the question. Um, I mean, they may be doing it now, I don't know, but certainly we didn't do it in the past and it was wrong. <laughs> no, and uh, undoing all of that would be quite difficult, I'm sure. Um, but, yeah, Thanks. sorry, there's two people with hands up right next to each other. Um, yeah, I'm curious to know what the council's position is to workplace parking levies. I don't think you've been very successful in generating income as a result of this. I wonder what the council's position is regarding this. Well, we, we do cover in the, in the inducement of demand for town centre parking in the, in the strategy. Um, Cheltenham Borough Council can't initiate a workplace parking levy. Um, it would be a county council thing to do, and the county council would be the body that would then spend the money as well as the highways authority. Um, so for the people who are asking about a workplace parking levy, it's going to have to be something that comes from the county council level. My personal view is it might, might be something that works in Cheltenham, it might not be. Um, but uh, as, the, as the person in charge of the climate emergency in Cheltenham, my, I would like the county council to tell us what they're interested in doing first. But I think crucially we want to know what the money was being spent on, um, because I think in the past we haven't always got great results as a result of um, what the county council has suggested that it might spend um, transport money on. Uh, an example at the moment, and I'm, I'm not opposed to the Cheltenham to Gloucester cycle route, I think it's fine, but I don't see many people saying that one place I want to cycle from Cheltenham is to Gloucester, and that's not anything to do with Gloucester, it's because the, most people when I talk to them they say I'd like to cycle from Cheltenham Kings into the town centre, I'd like to cycle from Presbury into the town centre, I'd like to go from up Hatherley to Battledown or whatever. So uh, I think it's much more complicated than just saying thing here could raise money and then the problem would be solved. I think we need to be a bit more um, a bit more holistic about that. But it's a good it's a very good question. Uh, next door. Um, a lot of people have raised tonight about the, the terrible traffic in Cheltenham. Um, I appreciate that some of this is county part of the reversing and saying and we need to step into it by connecting sort of that uh, transport to Gloucester County Council. But one thing Cheltenham Borough Council can do and we should do is is does have Yeah, next month. Okay. Um, the, um, the, the problem with the Air Quality Action Plan was that we, we reduced the size of the air quality management area, which is defined in legislation. And without going into too much detail, um, the air quality management area um, is defined by which monitors across town um, exceed 40 micrograms per cubic metre of carbon monoxide on a monthly basis, averaged out over 12 months. Um, and our area in Cheltenham used to be 
borough wide because there were monitors, I think maybe somewhere near here in Charlton Kings, but they were also right on the other side of the borough as well. <coughs> now the only monitors that show breaches um, by that measurement are broadly at the end of the high street, the, the lower high street area around the Royal Mail Depot and that very busy junction um, that goes down to Gloucester Road and up to Tewkesbury Road. Um, so our air quality management area has shrunk to that area. That doesn't mean that we're not monitoring air quality all across the borough. We continue to monitor the air quality um, in all the places where we always have. And actually we're taking a more dynamic approach. We're doing more monitoring outside schools and there's been some monitoring outside, uh, I think, Bourneside, um, which showed some interesting and perhaps conflicting results as well, which then had to be taken away for further, for further looks. Um, but I've spoken with Clean Air Cheltenham about this. Um, they were very keen uh, that we continued with a town-wide strategy, which is what we were going to do anyway. We were never going to just remove all of the air quality monitors and have it at the lower end of the high street. But what Claire Clean Air Cheltenham also wanted us to do was make clear what the policies and strategies were that fed into better air quality in Cheltenham. So rather than just doing the statutory document alone, which covers only the air quality management area, we're producing a document which then says, and here are all the other things that go behind it. And a key part of that for me was making sure that we got engagement from people like the NHS uh, and the County Council as well, because it's all very well Cheltenham Borough Council saying, here's our air quality action plan and it's borough wide, um, but we're not the transport authority. And the thing that happens that is the worst from bad air quality is people get ill. So what I wanted to do was bring in um, people from the NHS and people from the County Council so the County Council could actually be brought on board and to say, you know, we endorse this, this plan and these strategies that Cheltenham Borough Council is taking and also back that up with, um, with an expert from the NHS. So Dr Charlie Sharp is writing, um, writing a bit about um, air quality and the impacts of air quality which will be part of our plan as well. So um, for me it's not just about that statutory bit, it's about the wider borough um, and it's about maintaining vigilance and making sure that we're monitoring as much as we ever did and more because you know, the climate emergency declaration says that we should but also if we were just producing the report that we did before, which was the statutory bit with a few comments here and there, I kind of think it doesn't really uh, demonstrate the gravity of the situation. So it was important that we got other people involved as well. Uh, is there someone who hasn't asked a question before? Yes, lady here. Um, I was wondering what the strategy is around um, getting people out into nature and the biodiversity in this area. Uh, biodiversity is a separate section um, in, in the Climate Emergency Action Plan. The natural environment and biodiversity is there. Um, getting people out into nature is, is a different thing altogether, isn't it? And, um, and I, I think the Borough Council, again, what we can do is we can say in our local plan we are uh, we're reserving green spaces, local green space designation, which is a really important part of our local plan. Um, we can continue to look after the areas that we already do, like um, Leckhampton Hill and Charlton Kings Common. Uh, and uh, and look at you know, making sure that we make sure that our parks, for example, have um, wildflower areas in. Um, we don't have a, a massive parks team, it has to be said, um, but we are on the edge of uh, an area of outstanding natural beauty, and there's a lot of countryside around. So I think it's just important that we maintain that access um, through development. I think that is an important point, and planning's been mentioned quite a lot. I hate to bang on about planning, but it's, you know, it's a thing, isn't it? Um, making sure that when um, developers come in, they are building in green spaces into, into new developments, I think is important. And that is one of the principles that we're working on at the Northwest Cheltenham development at Swindon Village, uh, sort of up towards the, the motorway junction, um, but also at the Golden Valley development at the west of town. And um, we'll be making sure that we are working green spaces into that as well. Uh, and clearly the, the concept of biodiversity net gain isn't something that's just been pushed locally now. It is one of the areas where all the signals from government are actually quite good. And the question is how that then filters into national planning legislation so we can then enforce it at the local level. It is, it, it's not yet answered, but, um, but we do cover that in the action plan and in the climate SPD as well. Would it be something that would um, affect planning? I mean, would, would there be a way to um, protect areas where we knew that there's a lot of biodiversity? Can you speak up? I can't hear what you're saying. Sorry, I was just saying, is there, will there be something that will protect areas where we know there's, going to, there's biodiversity which might stop planning, you know, um, houses being built in those areas? It depends. 
I think is the answer, because clearly if you're in an AONB or a, an SSSI, there are certain protections in planning rules in the same way that there's protections against building in Greenbelt, for example. Um, I think it, it does depend on what you're talking about, and there's lots of different site-specific um, points there that, that need to be picked up. But, um, but biodiversity net gain doesn't necessarily mean building nothing. What it means is that when you are building something, developers and people who are coming in and doing other stuff um, they have to then make sure that uh, nature benefits as well as providing shelter for people or new uh, employment matters. Just conscious of the time, um, Mr. Abbott knows that you can't feel that, so there's one, two more questions, I think. Two more would be good, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, I think the gentleman with the beard there was. Uh, Hello, uh, regarding air quality and waste, do you know what proportion? Off the top of my head, I don't know, but I think our recycling rate's about 55%, mm -hmm. which isn't bad for an urban area. Um, but I don't know the proportion that goes to the incinerator. I'm reluctant to say the rest all goes to the incinerator. Um, but if you want, we can we can find out. I can find out and get back to you. Can I just also just say, actually, we're hoping to invite Karen Watson from uh, the Borough Council and uh, a lady called Kat Turner from the County Council to come and talk next time or the time after, talk about waste and disposal. So you might get some answers there. Karen would absolutely know the answer to that. I guarantee. Um, I, I think the gentleman in the back there was the... Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, I missed most of your talk, which is quite unfortunate, I've got the time wrong. Um, in the plan, you've got 68 actions over the next eight years, and you've um, coded them according to sort of first, second, and third priorities. Are those fixed, or are you prepared to have some suggestions about how you could do those in different sequence and how they might synergize if you did? Because there isn't a total logic Uh, the plan is flexible. One of the points that I made earlier on, perhaps before you arrived, the, the plan is flexible and can be updated depending on technological change or, or new knowledge that comes uh, that comes into the, the council or um, or new discoveries. So it it is flexible. Um, uh, we can talk at, at length later on if you would like. I think the the key point about the um, the actions is that it's not like plant tree here and build building here. It's a bit broader, which does retain that level of flexibility. I'm going to cheat here and ask a question myself. Um, but I think it's a, it's, this, there's one thing, um, I mean, I personally, my, sometimes uh, the documents, etc., are buried, buried within the Borough Council websites. So I just wondered if there's a way that you're going to kind of find a way of communicating regularly with people and also you know, on monitoring progress and how we will be able to see and follow it and hopefully bring you back and challenge you again. <coughs> Well, the web address, I think there's a short address, which is chelon.gov.uk slash climate. And that takes you to all the climate change pages. That document, I don't think, is yet up on, on those pages, um, but it will be. Um, and the Connecting Chelon Report and the Carbon Neutral Chelon Report are on those pages already. Um, if you want to find out all of the stuff that's going on, follow the Chelon Borough Council social media pages. That's, that's quite a good idea, and all of the... All of the uh, all of the developments that are happening in, in climate tend to be put up there, uh, mostly because I think it's important um, and I've suggested that the, the comms team needs to, uh, to do more on the environment because it's probably the thing that we get asked the most questions about, um, apart from why was my bin collection missed. <laughs> um, uh, but we've actually got very good bin collection mates. Um, uh, apart from this week. Apart from this week where we're one day behind. <laughs> that, was, that was put out on the council's social media channels. Um, uh, sorry, and what was the other? Um, no, no, but it was really about monitoring progress. How we can the monitoring keep up progress. To, yes, sorry. Up to date. Um, so a, a, a key principle has to be uh, openness and transparency, and willing to admit that the change of culture happens when you start referring yourself for further scrutiny. Uh, and as a liberal, I think scrutiny and openness and transparency is a good thing. So what I've suggested we do is do more um, carbon footprint reporting and that we do an annual report to the Cheltenham Borough Council Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which then means there is, there is a regular feedback loop that's put into the system um, and, and we will we'll be reporting back annually on our carbon footprint um, and probably annually on 
the uh, actions that are taken against the action plan as well. Okay, well. Can I just raise one issue? Mm -hmm. Not that Cheltenham's now in Tewkesbury, all the Tewkesbury Road and King's Dish and all around there is in Tewkesbury. I mean, you're not monitoring, presumably, what's going on up there, but it's Tewkesbury. I mean, in terms of air quality, for example. And how are you going to coordinate all this? It seems to me the big flaw in all this is you release a, a county-wide plan with local plans being subsidiary to the, like, the county-wide plan. Because you're all interconnected, aren't you? And you've got this talk about linking up Cheltenham and Gloucester and all the rest of it. So what relevance is Cheltenham's strategy in context of the other authorities around about? The are they all doing the same, talking from the same pit sheet? There is a new group called Climate Leadership Gloucestershire, and uh, that includes not just the councils, but also uh, the police and the NHS and the clinical commissioning group um, and, uh, and other, other organisations as well. Um, uh, and that, uh, including the local nature partnership as well, um, and that is where the county level uh, work is happening. Um, we've had two meetings so far. Um, it's chaired and vice chaired on a cross party basis, which is really important for maintaining um, that momentum, I think, which is really important. Um, because clearly you can just create another talking shop and, uh, and there's no pressure to sort of speed up and do anything. Actually, if, what you find is if you've got a Conservative in the chair and a Green in the vice chair and then they switch halfway through the year um, and then maybe the next one is a Lib Dem, a Labour person, and they switch, you do end up with the political momentum um, not grinding to a halt. Um, and one of the principles that's been set out in the Climate Leadership Gloucestershire group um, is that we have a meeting, some actions are set, and then things happen. We don't just wait until the end of the pattern of meetings before things uh, before things start moving on. The next one is transport, um, and I think that's in April. Uh, and we were, we were told that the transport report that's coming from GCC is going to be dynamite. Um, and we're all uh, I think there is a lot of um, a lot of interest um, in what's going to be coming from the transport thing because clearly that is um, that is a massive part of our um, county's carbon footprint and a massive part of the challenge that. Uh, various people tonight have, have raised in terms of behavioural change as well. And I think it's actually it's really encouraging to see that the County Council is bringing forward a report to say here are the things that we're going to do and here's how we're going to work with the different districts um, to, to achieve uh, the net zero targets that actually all of the councils in, um, in Gloucestershire have set. So I'm going to call it there for now. I just want to say thank you to Councillor Matt Wilkinson because this is a big deal. He's not, he's not here, he can't solve this. This is all on his own. I think what I would also say is it's, it's hugely much a, a community effort as well. And I want to say very much encouraged by the fact that I went to the From the Ground Up a couple of weeks ago at the Sustainability Feathers Festival and there were just so many groups that we talked to. Um, there was, um, I talked to Tetbury Greening, the Tewkesbury Friends of the Earth, um, Transition Clean, Vision 21, Planet Cheltenham, Cheltenham Zero, and they're all trying to do the same thing. Now, I know that may seem, if for this gentleman and one or two others who've been doing this an awful long time, that must be, you know, so what? You know, there's a hell of a lot to be done here. But actually, the fact that we are talking to each other, and, and two or three people have come to me this evening and also talked to me, it's a really important role that we, within the community, work together to do to make something happen. And just to let you know, from CK Futures' perspective, at the moment we're running a food waste minimisation program uh, where we're trying to get people to think differently back to, you know, how do we build momentum. From the summer onwards, we're going to be looking at nature, the environment, so back to the question that was asked here, how do we get people outside, how do we get people to appreciate the areas they're in, how far can they, you know, can they travel without their cars, and in the uh, autumn we'll be looking at conscious consumerism. So again, Black Friday, Halloween, Christmas, how do we get people to think differently about these big events and spend less or spend it differently? So again, and it's just this one community, and, and I've been lucky enough to work with Leckhampton Parish Council, Swindon Village, and a number of others. So I would say from wherever you're coming from, talk to those people, as well as talking to Max and his team, and, and working together, we might actually get somewhere. So thank you again for coming this evening. It's been, it's been great to hear from you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, there's... <laughs>